I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Emil Brix, who is, uh, is with us on many of our events at IASC, and even previously with our Institute for Social and European Studies. Um, Emil Brix is an Austrian diplomat and historian, and he is a representative chairman of the Institute for the Danube Region in Central Europe. He also became the director of the Diplomatic Academy of um, Vienna, and he has been a friend and colleague for many years in our activities. So welcome again, Emil, and we we'll wait to hear what you to have to say. Thank you very much. I will stay here if I may. I will stay here if I may for the panel discussion. Um, thank you for the invitation to come here. I do understand that we are in a city like uh, Vesprem because it's the cultural capital of Europe. Uh, whether it's the time of war in Ukraine or not, this would have been and will be the cultural capital of Europe for this year. Uh, so just to put things a little bit into perspective, I fully agree how urgent um, uh, Sir uh, Richard described the situation that we are in. I fully agree that this is a, a global conflict between one way of living and the other way of living. And I fully agree that uh, the words that he, he used for, uh, for explaining uh, what's at stake. But at the same time, I have a few questions. The question is, is it really about how fast we, the West, can send weapons there and how fast the Russians can do this that will decide in the, on this war, that will decide the outcome of this war? Maybe. I hear more and more from military experts, I'm not one, that the West is sending weapons in a way that it is not challenging the Russians to use nuclear options. So the, for the Russians not to respond in a nuclear way, the West is hesitant to send too much too fast. Maybe this is true. I hear that more and more, not only from people who some try to understand Mr. Putin, if you want to call it like that. If this is true, then one could say, Reasonable, reasonable, or one could say totally wrong, uh, because it will continue the war, the time of the war, with all the losses that we have there. So, th th one of the things is we are in a situation of uncertainty, where first of all we do not know what the facts that we hear are true and by whom we hear them, not even in our Western context. Uh, and we do not know, if they are true, what the consequences would be. That's part of this sort of, not even in our ideas and narratives, we are resilient. And there seemed to be no need to be resilient. Because it was what the Germans called Friedensdividende. It was a time of peace after the end of the Cold War uh, and the unilateral moment in time. So why bother? Why bother with spending on the military? Why bother with making ideological decisions? Why bother with defending something like liberal democracy? Uh, what we learned in the meantime, that it's necessary. And so why I think this war, on the one hand, is less important that uh, as some uh, military experts tell us, because there are so many wars on other parts of the world. But on the other hand, it's maybe more important, because it tells us that we need to be resilient in so on so many grounds and fields. And there, I would say, there where culture comes in. Uh, Sir Richard said that the West 
did already win the battle of the, nar of the narratives. And I would love to agree that we won the battle of the, of the narrative about this war. But we won it only in the West. We didn't win it in Russia. And that's where, where we should have won it, actually. It's also important not to have too many people uh, dissenting here. But it's about, about Russia. So we don't, shouldn't make the mistake that we, that we think that we won this battle of, 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 of narratives. And the second thing is, I always ask myself, how, how did it all come about? And there, I think it's, it, it's very clear. Uh, it came about because a few things still matter in how we look at the world and how we study the world. History still matters. And this would need a long discussion now on what history means, what the past means, what memory means, uh, how collective memory is used in politics, uh, how Mr. Putin and others um, uses uh, past uh, to create the, their idea of, of, of the nation and the state, actually. Uh, but it, let's call it history matters. That means that ideas matter. Even if there is not too much ideological thinking around the globe at the moment, but ideas matter. And secondly, geography matters. Place matters. Uh, that's also very obvious. Small example, I am an Austrian. We always say, why should we be able to defend ourselves? We are an alpine country. Small, we are not a danger to anyone. We are surrounded by NATO countries, with the exception of Liechtenstein and Switzerland. And the Swiss are quite well in defending themselves. So why should we defend ourselves? Uh, and this is a, one of the, of, the, of, the, of the many arguments that you have when you talk about geography. Uh, and I do understand that, that uh, Sweden and Finland are in a different geographical position than Austria is at the moment. I do understand that they want to join NATO. But I would say understanding uh, where we are would also include to say that in a country like mine, in Austria, we need this discussion about security, in spite of geography, for many reasons, for, for good moral reasons that we should defend the right people and the right side, but also in our own national interest. And by the way, there are people, I'm one of them who try to create a discussion about security issues in Austria. Uh, and uh, I have to say I don't understand because I also like the solidarity that we are showing now in this in this uh, in this war with uh, Ukraine, but I just don't understand the position of the individual European countries. Austria is a neutral country, Hungary is a NATO country. Austria is giving more support to Ukraine than Hungary is giving to the Ukraine. So sometimes I don't understand what that means actually, for our solidarity also and the way we organize European security, I have to say. Um, but let's get back to geography matters. One of the things that, that this conflict shows us very much is that we all depend on our, on our way of supply lines. On that, that means geography also. I was asked after there was the sabotage on the North Stream 2 pipeline whether I have an idea who is responsible. And you know all these uh, hypotheses. It might have been the Americans we heard recently. It might have been the British we heard. Um, uh, some people say it, those who have most interest is certainly uh, those who don't want that Europe gets oil and, and gas from, from Russia. Uh, but I have to say, it, to me, 
it sounds very obvious that it was the Russians. That it was the Russians and nobody else. Uh, but in our, my context, it means, you see, geography matters here again. And it does make sense that we discuss now suddenly that whether there are cables under the water we be connecting Norway to, to Europe or Europe to the US or wherever it is, how important this has become. This war is a reminder, and I think that's, that's one of the few positive things that we have to look into connectivity, supply lines, much more than we, than we used to. Actually, we Central Europeans always talked about connectivity, and we called it plurality, diversity, and things like that, but we related it actually to the development of ideas. The creativity of Vienna around 1900 and things like that, or Budapest around 1900. But here it's about connecting it also to the, the to the real connectivity of pipelines, and energy was mentioned. Uh, so I think what we what we what we see in this in in this war, and I'm not an expert on scenarios of how to end this war. What I see there is that it is important to discuss already now what the consequences will be. <laughs> and for sure, the consequences uh, will be, uh, do we have ways to explain narratives better? Do we have ways to differentiate between facts and fiction better? Uh, do we have ways to well, do something which I, which I, I wonder whether it's, it's a good idea, uh, to draw red lines? You see, I, I wonder always, I have learned as a historian, but even, even as a, in, in school, red lines are lines we draw that the opponent is not crossing them. Now we are suddenly discussing in the West red lines that we are doing ourselves, that we should not cross. There's something wrong. Or maybe it's all red lines everywhere. So there are all, the, there are all these things that we could learn from, uh, from uh, what's, what, what is maybe the consequence. Uh, and then I shouldn't pray, uh, talk for too long. And uh, in, in basically, I'm also a, a hawk like you, if, if I'm allowed to say so. And I'm for deterrence. And I'm for knowing what, what's, what's white and what's black. But what about these almost already one million Germans signing a petition of peace now, suddenly, a manifesto of peace now? What should we do with them? Um, and at the same time, understanding that the political leaders in Germany, but Austria is a similar case, are very strong on saying how we have to defend our system against the Russian aggression. Uh, I think what we have to but what we have to do is really to to, to look for the uh, to for the argumentation. We need uh, this dialogue within our societies more than, uh, than we have it at the moment. Um, and Because they will not go away. And I tell you the story in, 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 in my country, in Austria. In the public discussion, you don't have anyone really sub uh, who defends the Russian aggression. But under the surface, you have millions almost of people who say, mm, wait and see. First of all, maybe we can profit after the war is over. Secondly, well, they are all nasty people, these politicians, anyhow, and these military leaders. So there's not much difference. They are all guilty. Uh, 
And thirdly, we Central Europeans are in an even worse situation because we always said we have a right to have a culture which has some sort of linkage to Russia, but also a linkage to Shakespeare. Uh, so uh, where are we now in Central Europe? Are, are we still allowed to do this? And when uh, are we now? Should we be quiet now and not, 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 talk, not talk about that there is something like a Central European culture? Maybe, yeah, we are more quiet than we used to be. But, uh, but, but I think so. We shouldn't allow here that this is the case because then it turns into a situation which we have now that you have within the European discussion, even in Central Europe countries like Poland, which is very outspoken, and very one, much on, on defending the European values, uh, and Hungary, where, where the situation is different to be not so outspoken. Well, or Slovakia might be similar sooner or later. Or Austria, where officially Austria is very strong, but under the surface things look different. So I would finish here actually in saying that uh, the most possible scenario for the for after this war is, as I see it, that we will have to create a European security architecture with Russia outside, with Ru Russia be the other. Um, uh, and I hope that this is peaceful coexistence then between us and Russia. I hope this is a real cold war, not worse. Uh, I don't see a chance that we can integrate Russia in the, in the nearer or medium future into such a system. Uh, and I would include uh, also human security issues, not <laughs> only security in hard, hard terms. So, uh, and this is where I think we diplomats come into play again uh, to formulate this, uh, this uh, European security architecture. Uh, and to be frank, the structures, the multilateral structures that we have at the moment needs to be reformed. It can't be that the P5 have, have among themselves the veto power to discuss such fundamental issues of global, of global concern uh, <laughs> if uh, one of them is against them. So there must be the reform there. It can't be that we have an organization for security and cooperation in Europe which cannot save security and cooperation in Europe. So why don't we have it? Um, uh, so we need a, a new Helsinki. We need a new moment to get together to discuss the European architecture again. Unfortunately, this time without Russia. And I have to say, <laughs> I'm almost not daring to say this, I would have hoped also without the US and Canada a real European security conference. But at the moment, I'm also a transatlanticist. Have to be. We'll see in the future what's necessary. But uh, I, I think I talked already for too long and told you too much about what I think politically. But let me, let me uh, finish with my experience when I arrived in winter 2015 in Moscow. I arrived on the 19th of January 2015 on Domodedevo Airport and was driven to the city center. The first thing I saw, I was with my wife Elizabeth, she's here as well. The first thing we saw was actually half naked men and women, old men and women, jumping into the cold water between the airport in Domedilevo uh, and the city center of Moscow. Why did they do this? Most of you will know, because it is a tradition, a Russian tradition, to jump into the cold water on the 19th of, um, uh, of, of January. Uh, and uh, if you analyze this, it's an act of redemption 
redemption, to get rid of your sins. That was the idea. That is the idea of doing this. And then I, we arrived. We stayed for, for, for some weeks in a hotel near the Kremlin, on the other side of the, of the river. And one of the first things that we experienced there was the death of the most prominent opposition person in Moscow, Boris Nemtsov, who was killed about less than 100 meters from the bed where I slept in. And I realized only next day morning on a Saturday. Why am I mentioning these two things? Just to say that maybe, maybe it's true. It's a different civilization. Maybe it's true. Um, but these sort of things, both, that we are looking for acts of redemption, we do everywhere, a around the globe, looking for acts of redemption. Not all of us are jump jumping into cold water. Uh, and maybe killing dissident voices, also doing something that we do everywhere. So I would not accept to say that Russia is a, is a, di is a totally different civilization. I would say you have a political regime there that wants to, us to believe that this is a different civilization. And we should not accept that this is the case. So I stop here. Thank you very much.